Hello and welcome to this webinar on geography and longitudinal data. I'm Oliver Duke Williams and I'm joined by Dr. Gundy Knees at the University of Essex and we're going to be talking about geography in the in understanding society and in the ONS longitudinal study. In a moment I'll hand you over to Gundy who's going to start the session talking about issues to do with geography in the in understanding society and after after Gundy's presentation I'm going to talk about the longitudinal study so at this stage um, I'll hand you over to Gundy in a moment I just want to say thank you to Vasilis Rutsis who in the background is doing some of the um, the work of controlling who sees what and who's presenting at what time so so thank you to Vasilis for that and I'll now try to hand you over to Gundy, who is going to talk to you about understanding society. Hello, guys. I hope you can now see. Um, in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the Understanding Society study design and content. And I will then launch into a description of what geographical identifiers um, we provide with the study and how it might be used. The study is rather complex, um, so I can't really cover um, all of it in 15 minutes that I have for this talk. But there will be some links for further information, and following Oliver's talk, um, there's also some time to ask us more questions, if you have any. As you um, may know, the UK has a remarkable suite of longitudinal studies, and Understanding Society has a special place in this, as it provides annual data that allow us to look at um, short, medium, and long-term effects of social and economic change on individual well-being. Unlike other studies, Understanding Society is not rooted in a particular discipline, such as demography, health, or economics, but it is designed to be useful for a whole range of disciplines. So it collects hard indicators, such as income and marital status, but it also has soft uh, well-being indicators, such as relationship satisfaction and income expectations. Now, in terms of content, the bulk of the questions we ask is around the six key topics listed in the left-hand side box um, of this slide. But there is also great detail on the contextual factors, such as neighborhoods and social networks, that may help explain key outcomes, such as what education we do, um, what we work as, and how healthy we are. Uh, Goody, I'm sorry, can I just interrupt you a minute? Can you just maximize your window, because the slides are appearing like... Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry for that. Yeah, Eric. that's perfect. Okay, sorry mm -hmm. about that. <laughs> so, but in addition to that, there's also some room for um, questions such as political behaviors and leisure activities, for instance, party support and participation in culture, media and sports. So in 2012, for instance, at the time of the Olympics, we asked about whether people um, were following the Olympics or whether they attended. Now, the best way to find out about what information is available is to visit the study website or the content highlight section of the user guide for a quick sort of overview. Now, another thing that is special um, f um, in understanding society is that it has a household focus of design. So we started with randomly selected addresses, and then each wave we follow the sample members as they move and form new households. And each time we do not collect information just about one pe person, but we collect information about all members of their household. Now, in terms of the, yeah, who is in the sample, the Understanding Society study really has two um, core elements. The first element is the continuing household panel survey sample. The sample was originally drawn in 1991 in Britain and later on incorporated boost samples for Wales and Scotland, as well as the sample for Northern Ireland from 2001 onwards. So already in 2001 or since 2001, the study has been um, a UK-wide longitudinal study. The continuum sample was then integrated into Understanding Society in 2010. Now, the second element of Understanding Society is the new household longitudinal study element that started in 2009 on 10 under the Understanding Society study brand name. The sample was much larger than that of the BHPS and designed so that it is representative for all regions of the UK. It also included an ethnic minority boost sample, and since 2015, there's also a boost sample for immigrants to the UK. 
Now, the bulk of our data is collected using face-to-face -face interviews with adults, so that's um, people aged 16 and over, and um, in self-completion interviews with children aged 10 to 15. On this slide and the next, I show you how the responding sample developed over time. So what we can see here is that there were just over or just under 20,000 respondents in the first wave of the BHPS, and the sample size increased greatly when understanding societies started, which was in 2009, as I said earlier. Now, in 2010, the continuing BHPS sample then provided around 12,000 interviews as part of the Understanding Society sample, increasing the total number of interviews with adults to over 50,000 10. But, of course, there's also um, attrition and, um, and non-response, which reduces the um, sample size over time. When we look at the um, sample um, with youth respondents, the pattern is actually um, pretty similar. So we can see that there were around 700 to 1,200 youth respondents in the BHPS from wave 4 onwards, so that's 1995, I think. And uh, when Understanding Society started, this increased to around 5,000 um, young people. So that is roughly 1,000 interviews for children of each age um, in sort of age um, 10 to 15 age group. So quite a large number. Now, Understanding Society is a prospective um, survey with retrospective elements, and the questions are repeated, and that is actually what allows us to look at change over time, but not every question appears in every year or is asked of every person, so there are rotating modules, event and age triggered questions for existence. In addition to the data collected in personal interviews, however, we also have collected really cool biological specimens during a health um, assessment in wave 2 and 3, and we have also got um, linked administrative records, for instance, from the National Pupil Database. And which is the focus of today's presentation, we have linked to a great deal of spatial context data. Now, because we have um, interviews, um, or as I said before, our interviews are mostly face-to-face, -face, so we know where each household lives at each wave of the survey. We can then use the postcode of that address to um, obtain further information about these places from the ONS postcode director. Um, the postcode directory provides a great deal of information, which you can read about more in the ONS uh, GeoPortal website, and I've put the, um, the URL um, on this slide. And for our study, we extract more than a dozen key administrative unit identifiers and neighborhood classifications, and we make these then available for each household in the sample for each wave and um, the data can access by analysts such as yourselves via a download from the UK data service who distribute all our data. So, in this table I list the geographical information that is readily available with our data. So if you want these data you can replace the four dollar signs in the URL provided at the bottom of the um, slide. Um, here with the study number that is listed in the second column of, um, of that table. And um, this uh, directly links to the UK uh, data service shopping basket and then there is a quick registration um, and uh, application process that you will be guided through by the UK data service. And the letters um, in the third column um, of this table indicate um, the access um, rules um, under which the data typically are being made available, um, which is either standard end user license, a special license, or a secure data access. Now, the main interview data from Understanding Society is available as study numbers 6614 and 6931, and uh, this contains the region identifier and a course rule urban indicator. Now, if you want to um, have access to more detailed urban uh, indicators, you can also access these, but um, you then would have to choose between the 2001 and 2011 census versions of this, um, and there is also um, other um, sort of versions. So we have the output area classification, and then we have ACON types. And um, what is also um, pretty cool is um, the study number 7533, which um, we basically have linked for waves one to three of Understanding Society 
um, data from the Department for um, Transport's accessibility statistics, and this gives you easy access to more than 600 unique pieces of information um, that has been longitudinally harmonized um, and provides information about key services that are available or not to um, people in our sample. Now, if this is um, not enough or not what you want, you um, also have the um, possibility to, um, to link your own data. And um, for this, we provide um, a whole range of um, official geographical um, lookup data. And uh, the important thing here um, to say is that um, sometimes the official codes and boundaries change over time. So um, if you want to link your own data, it is a good idea to try and link your external data with the ONSPD first um, to see whether your data are compatible um, with um, our format. So when you go to the download section of, um, of our data, so um, you click on the URL on the previous slide and um, replace the study number, you will find that um, we produce um, or provide a file called um, like a geographical lookup file, and that tells you exactly which version of the um, ONSPD was used for which wave of understanding society and um, for which indicator. So it should be really easy to, um, to test it out. Now, we often get asked about the smallest geographical area for which predictions can be made. And uh, in this table, I list some of the key um, UK geographies and um, show you how many of these are represented in the wave one sample. Now, the smallest geographies are listed at the top and the largest um, at the bottom. You can see that we have a good number of cases in all regions. This is the areas highlighted green. And there may be enough cases within the local authorities and the travel to work areas represented in the study um, too. So this is highlighted in, um, in yellow. For smaller geographies, we also have a very good representation in the study that is, for instance, for the output areas, um, there are overall um, more than 200,000 um, output areas in the UK, and we um, represent um, more than 10% uh, of all of these. But um, when you look at the number of cases within each um, output area that we observe um, there, uh, the number is very small. So ultimately, what this means is that for smaller area characteristics, so those highlighted in red, you would probably want to link um, area characteristics from external sources rather than make out of sample predictions from understanding society. Now, when you're analyzing um, neighborhood context data um, longitudinal, and this is true whichever scale you're looking at, it is important to consider that there are at least four possible sources for change in the neighborhood context. As analysts, we are probably um, mostly interested in the change that occurred to people moving and, uh, and in the change that manifests itself in a particular place over time and which could therefore help causally explain differences in individual outcomes. But change in the neighborhood co uh, context may um, ultimately also be observed because of changes in measurement. So, for instance, the method to draw the spatial boundaries may have changed, or the categorization of the neighborhood types has been amended. So, um, one of the typical examples here is that um, there were quite a large number of um, redefinition of output areas in um, between the 2001 and the 2011 censuses, and um, I believe Oliver is going to say a little bit more about that in, um, in his presentation later on. So let's look at um, an applied example from Understanding Society. So here we um, compare basically um, levels of change in three different neighborhood classifications which we provide with the Understanding Society data with the census-based classifications um, on the left-hand side. Um, we need to um, worry a little bit about boundary changes that occurred over time as we use different versions of the OS ONS um, postcode directory. Um, look up file to extract these um, classifications, but we do not worry, or we do not need to worry much about the changes in the definition of output areas or rural urban type because these are fixed to represent the census 2001 characteristics. Now, for the ACON typology on the right, we use the 2015 version for all waves, so definitions and boundaries are identical across waves. Now, in this setting, change over time in the neighborhood context uh, that we see in the data, or in the linked data, I should say, um, can only occur due to individuals moving and only if they move from one type of neighborhood to another. 
The downside um, of this approach is, of course, that we cannot then look at how neighborhoods change for non mobs And uh, this means that for 90% of us who do not move from one year to the next, we actually do not have information about how neighborhood change um, or the neighborhood change that affected. So how much change do we observe then wave on wave for, non, uh, for movers? Now here in the slide we can see that the lowest level of um, change is observed using the rural urban classification which only considers urbanicity and settlement structures. This is because most moves are to and from settlements of the same type or from rural areas to um, urban areas. And typically then once you have lived in an urban area you don't move back to a rural area. Levels of change are somewhat higher using the output area and ACON classification, which consider sociodemographic and lifestyle profiles as well as settlement structure. Now, from an analysis point of view, um, you will probably have more um, information about change to exploit when you use these um, output area classifications or ACON, but really the key decision to make is probably in terms of information content. So when you analyze individual level data from 2009 and to 2011, which is the case when you look at wave data from wave 1 and wave 2 of understanding society, do you think it is more relevant that the neighborhood or what the neighborhood looked like up to 10 years um, before the respondent moved there? Um, or is it more relevant what the neighborhood they moved to will look like up to five years after they moved there? Now, both of these sort of um, context characteristics that we um, provide our approximate, uh, approximate measures, um, but only you can decide which is the most appropriate choice in your particular um, analysis case. Now, um, I'm kind of running out of time, so um, if you want to read more about this uh, and for exact number of cases in the non-condensed classifications um, for the output area classifications, etc., you can follow the link um, I provide at the bottom of um, this slide and um, uh, there's also um, some further links um, for you to follow um, if you want to learn more about understanding society and uh, the different access rules. There is a uh, link to the online documentation here and um, also to the Understanding Society data on the um, UK Data Service website. Um, on the Understanding Society documentation website, there's also a link to the Understanding Society user support, so that's also a place where you can ask um, further questions. But um, yeah, first um, I'm now handing over to um, Oliver who will introduce us to geography in the ONS Longitudinal Studies and I'll be here from you later. Right, for now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gundi. As Gundi said, I'm going to talk about the ONS Longitudinal Study and about issues relating to geography in, in the LS. Understanding society, which Gundy was just talking about, is a, a superb source and gives us annual uh, observations of households. The LS, the ONS Longitudinal Study, offers decennial observations of the population of England and Wales. So it's covering a much larger time in terms of the overall length of period of time it covers, but it's doing it at different intervals. The LS is based on four sample birth dates. That's a sampling rate of four out of 365, which gives about 1% of the population of England and Wales. An important aspect of the LS is that sample members don't know that they're in the sample. The four sample birth dates are not disclosed. I could be in the sample, you could be in the sample, none of us know. The data for England and Wales include both census data from 1971 through to 2011 and administrative data. Access to the data is controlled and I'll give a little bit more information about how you can use it at the end of the talk. In the UK there are three longitudinal studies, one in England and Wales, one in Scotland, and one in Northern Ireland. They all have different time uh, periods that they cover, 
and they have different sample sizes. They also differ in the range and the amount of additional data that's linked to them. But all of them have broadly similar secure access arrangements. This slide summarizes some of the differences between those three studies. So the ONS longitudinal study, which is what I'm talking about today mostly, uh, is based on four birth dates. The Scottish longitudinal study is based on 20 birth dates. And the Northern Ireland longitudinal study is based on 104 birth dates. So very different sample sizes. One of the things to note is that the sample birth dates are each contained within, the, within each study. So the four sample birth dates in the ONS LS are part of the 20 birth dates in Scotland, and those 20 birth dates are part of the 104 birth dates in Northern Ireland. What's in the LS? Well, similar to census microdata, or the SARS, with which some of you might be familiar, we have all of the variables from the census form uh, from individuals. Uh, but we have more detail than in the safeguarded and in the open microdata samples. As in understanding society, we have observations of all people in the households. We only track the sample members. So as they move from household to household over 10, 20, 30 years, we'll see other people in the household at the time of each census, but we don't follow those other people longitudinally. We've got an illustration of that here. This is a diagram representing a sample member who was born in the late 1960s and is observed in the LS in 1971, 81, 91, and so on. And we can compare two time points. In 1981, that person we'll probably see in a household, they're aged about 12 or 13 then, we'll see them in the household with a sibling and with parents. By the time we see that same person, 30 years later in 2011, the other people in that household are likely to be that person's partner and that person's children. As I said, we have all of the uh, regular questions from the census, all the responses to the questions in the census forms. And this slide just summarizes some of those. And on the right-hand side, uh, showing some of the variables that have been introduced more recently uh, compared to the others which have been in all the way through. In addition to census data, we have linked administrative data as well. So we have births of uh, sample members. So if a, if a person is born on one of the four birth dates, they immediately enter the study at that point. We also know about all births to sample mothers. We know about widowerhoods and widowhoods, and we know about deaths of sample members. So for sample members who die, we have linked mortality data, so we know the cause of death. And a typical usage of longitudinal data is to compare that cause of death to things that occurred much earlier in the person's life. This diagram comes from the ONS website and gives a summary of the total number of people who've entered and entered so, sorry, who've entered and left the sample in various different ways. These slides, as well as Gundy's, will be shared with you after the, after the webinar. Another couple of slides taken from ONS. This one tracks the 1971 sample members on the left-hand side and looks at what's happened to them over time. So the yellow dots, as we move across the columns, show the sample members who are still present uh, through to 2011. And the other dots, the, uh, the white dots, shows, show those sample members who've died. And the small amount of green dots in the middle shows the people who, have known, who are known to have migrated out of the UK or out of England and Wales. This slide looks from the other direction. It starts on the right-hand side with all the people in 2011 and looks at how they entered the sample. 
So the bottom part of that diagram, I apologize that this has red and green coloring, so I'll explain the diagram. The bottom part of the right-hand column is 233,000 people who entered the sample at some stage at birth. The middle section, 64,000, are people who've migrated into the UK, into England and Wales. And the, the larger part, the 265,000, uh, are people who entered at a particular census. The other columns show the people in the 2011 census uh, as they can be observed in earlier censuses. A few developments that we've done since 2011, uh, we did a series of beta test projects uh, related to the 2011 data. Uh, we've introduced synthetic data, um, and I'm not going to talk about that today, but there are uh, links on websites that I'll mention later about that. We're involved with consultations towards the 2021 census, and we've uh, done various other presentations and roadshows and so on. So on to the main uh, body of our talk today, uh, geography in the LS. The LS consists of multiple files. So we have a file for each census, we have files for members and for, for sample members and for other persons in the households, and we have samples for various other sorts of administrative data. When you use the LS, a support officer will create an extract linking across all the relevant files and produce one single file for your use. In this talk, I'm going to concentrate just on the census files. The most detailed geographies are contained within a set of restricted access tables, also known as X files, which most researchers don't have uh, permission to use or to see. So these most detailed geographies can't be used for standard analysis or for reporting results, but they can be used for linking other variables. When we talk about geography in the LS, it's important to remember that there are in fact lots of different types of geography that we might be thinking about. We have place of enumeration, and place of usual residence. For most people, those two are the same thing, but not always. We have place of second residence, uh, relating to a question in the 2011 census. We have place of work. We have place of usual residence at some stage in the past. Each census has asked where you lived one year ago, whether it was the same place you're living now or somewhere else. We have students' term time addresses. We have country of birth. We have place of birth and place or place of enumeration in 1939. So for people in our study who are old enough, we have some data on where they were registered at the beginning of the war in 1939. I've mentioned that because it's quite an interesting variable, but in practice it's one that uh, is not always complete and is quite hard to use. So it's there more for interest rather than for offering serious analytical worth. At this stage, I want to uh, launch another poll. So as I mentioned, one of the items of geography we have is a country of birth. So we've got a question here for people listening. To the nearest thousand people, how many people do you think there were in the 2011 census in England and Wales? who were born in Croatia. The uh, sample answers that we've got, 12,000, 10,000, 8,000, or 6,000, are all based on the, the normal, if you like, aggregate census, the census that most people are familiar with, that contains all people. The LS, of, a, of course, is a sample it will contain about 1% of these people. Okay. <clears throat> so we've got 19% uh, of people saying 12,000, 24% saying 10,000, 27% saying 8,000, and 30% saying 6,000 people. The correct answer is uh, the third option, 8,000. I said that's to the nearest 
1,000 uh, people. The actual number was around 8,200. And for those of you who are interested, of all the uh, countries in the last 16 of the World Cup, uh, Croatia were 15th largest in terms of number of people in England and Wales. Only Uruguay had fewer people. Of course, that was based on data collected in 2011, and the situation might have changed since then. And I asked that question not just um, to try and maintain interest in the, the webinar, but also to point out that we need to think a little bit about geography. Croatia was recognized by the UK and by other EU countries as a sovereign state in 1992. But of course, many of the people in the census uh, are, are old enough that they were born before 1992. And I haven't been able to look at a distribution of people born in Croatia by, by age, but I presume at least some of them were born before 1992. And this makes us think about how we relate to uh, a field like country of birth. Is it the country that exists now? Is it a country recognized as a sovereign state? Or is it something else? OK, I've now got a series of slides in which I want to look at each census in turn uh, from 1971 through to 2011 and consider some of the uh, types of geography that can be used in each census. So starting with 1971, our earliest census data, you can use a number of uh, spatial fields. Standard region, county and district, local authority, new towns, regional health authorities, area health authorities, and health districts. There are two types of geography mentioned at the bottom, in red and in brackets, wards and grid references. I've marked those in red because they're in the restricted files. So you won't be able to see those, uh, those identifiers, but you may be able to, to use them in some way in discussion with your support officer. The grid references in 1971 are a mixture of 100 meter level uh, accuracy and 1,000 or 1 kilometer uh, level of accuracy, depending on whether you're in an urban area or a rural area. 1971 is also a little bit messy in terms of uh, the way that we've got both pre and post 1974 variables. 1974 was when the um, effects of the 1972 Local Government Act came into force. I know from looking at the institutions that, um, that people who've signed up for the webinar uh, mentioned that uh, not all of you are from the UK. One of the things that is notable about the UK, uh, as Gundy uh, suggested earlier, was that we change our local geography an awful lot. Between every census, there'll be changes in local geography which makes it difficult to do any sort of uh, analysis over time. So in 1971, we've got both pre and post 1974 variables. Uh, there's a slight issue with that in that um, the, I'm hoping I'm getting this the right way around, the uh, post 1974 variables are about place of enumeration and the pre 1974 codings are about place of residence. As I said earlier, of course, for most people, place of enumeration and place of residence are the same thing, but that's not always true. Moving forward to 1981, we've got a broadly similar set of types of geography that can be used. We introduced another type in 1981, travel to work area. And we also have a new uh, low-level observation enumeration district which were the smallest area units available in 1981. Again, those, uh, those, the ones at the bottom, ward and enumeration district, are only available uh, in restricted files. So you can provide data to link to them, you can use them in certain ways, but you won't be able to see those, see those values and you won't be able to use them to report results. 
Moving on to 1991, again, broadly, we have the same sort of sets of headline geographies. Although, of course, it's important to remember that some of these change over time in terms of detail. So we have this, we have districts in 71, in 81, and 91, but they're not always exactly the same, those districts. In 1991, we also have an additional uh, restricted uh, observation of postcode. Moving on to 2001, there were quite a lot of changes. We no longer use standard region, we use government office region as, as our large regional identifiers. And, and those two sets of regions are, are similar but not quite the same. Reflecting perhaps political interest uh, and things that were important at the time, we no longer have Newtown as a coding. We've introduced national parks for, for people who live in national park areas. Um, there are parliamentary constituency, Westminster parliamentary constituency, and European uh, parliamentary constituency codings as well. We have a larger set of restricted area codings. Wards, uh, parishes, primary care group and primary care trust, and grid reference. In 1991, we had enumeration districts. In 2001, these had been replaced with output areas, which are uh, the smallest unit with which most people who are used to doing census analysis will probably be familiar with. Grid references in 2001 uh, were more detailed than those used in, in previous uh, censuses. Then finally, most recently, in looking at 2011, then we have a similar sort of set of headline areas, government, office regions, counties, districts, and so on. And again, we have a much broader range of uh, restricted level geography uh, that can be used for linking other uh, data and so on. As well as output area, we've got uh, LSOAs, lower level super output areas, MSOAs, middle layer super output areas. We have workplace zones. Workplace zones were a new geography introduced in 2011. And then were introduced because of a problem that had arisen in trying to look at workplace statistics. In the past, all data about workplace statistics, including place of work and journey to work, had been tabulated using residential geographies. And in many parts of the country, that's not terribly helpful. And the most, uh, the easiest example that we always quote for this is the City of London. Thousands of people work in the City of London, but very few people live there. So it makes sense to break the City of London down into, into multiple small units, uh, and not to try and use the residential geography, which wouldn't be very helpful. And these small units are called workplace zones. So in city centres, they tend to be very detailed. In more residential areas, they're larger than output areas, and they're designed to be large enough that we can tabulate data using them. So for both 2001 and 2011, we have output areas. And an implication of that is that if you want to use another sort of geography, uh, that then anything that can be built using output areas uh, can be produced. Before moving on to the next slide, I just want to point out uh, one thing I didn't mention there. In 2011, we have a set of 1991 district codes. As well as districts changing their boundaries, they also change their codes over time. 1991 districts are available almost all the way through our sequence. They're the easiest thing to use if you want to, use, want to do uh, sort of long-term change over time observations. With a bit of fiddling, you can use other sets of districts as well. But the 1991 districts are the easiest ones to use. And districts are the smallest areas for which we can normally tabulate results. In some cases, districts might, be need, might need to be joined together, typically for City of London and City of Westminster, because nobody lives in the City of London. As I mentioned, using output areas is relatively easy for data to be recoded. 
If you want to do this, you can supply to your support officer uh, a lookup table with every output area and the way you want to recode that output area, and your support officer will be able to assist in recoding the data. As well as using OAs to recode data in that sort of way, we can also use them to attach contextual or area level data to the rest of the data in, for, for the purposes of analysis. So again, users submit a data set uh, with an observation for every OA, and it's possible for that to be attached to unit records. However, in doing that, it must not be possible uh, for someone to deduce a location smaller than district size from the final results. And the way that's normally suggested to get around this is to convert the raw values in your table of observations to deciles or a similar, uh, similar transformed form of the data. And people have done a wide variety of projects using this approach of attaching data at small areas. Uh, people have attached environmental data, uh, such as weather data. Uh, we've uh, done a small project attaching house price data. And essentially anything that can be produced at output area level can in principle be attached. If you want to use the LS, it's free at the point of use. And it can be used in one of two ways. Either you can uh, use a secure setting at the ONS offices, in which case you'll be able to run your own code and, and see results, but you won't be able to take any results out of the secure setting um, unless they satisfy disclosure requirements. And the disclosure requirements are that you can't have any values in a, in a crosstab or a similar set of results smaller than 10 persons. If you're unable to attend uh, an ONS office uh, and they're limited to London to Titchfield and to Southport, and most people, uh, for most people, it's the London office that they attend. If you're unable to do that, you can submit code remotely, and that code will be run by support officers. Again, if the outputs of that code satisfy disclosure requirements, then they, it could, those outputs can be returned to the researcher under uh, usual restrictions that those results can't be passed on to anyone else until final clearance has been granted. If you want more information, there are a couple of URLs on this slide, ucl.ac.uk slash Celsius for information about the uh, ONS Longitudinal Study and about Celsius, who support it, and calls.ac.uk, which supplies information about all three longitudinal studies. So it also provides information about the studies in Scotland and in Northern Ireland. Uh, finally, because I'm, I'm running over a little bit, uh, if you want to apply, it, you need to be an accredited researcher, and the website explains how to do that, and you need to have an approved project. And with Celsius and with the other support, with the other longitudinal studies as well, uh, the support teams will assist you and advise on how to complete the form, etc.